Are MLMs a cult? Well, genetically modified skeptic and his YouTube channel video, link in the description, thinks just that. And he has a definition that goes beyond the Merriam-Webster definition of cult, right? It goes to an expert within the field. Mm. So let's watch a little excerpt and do a review of his video that talked about MLMs as a cult. And make sure to stay tuned until the end because I'll give a little recap as well. I was a Herbalife distributor for 18 months, spent well over $7,000, and have not recouped any money. I was a Herbalife distributor for less than two months, and I lost almost $5,000. In the eight months that we were in, we lost at least $10,000. You freaking freaks! What will you learn? What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! Multi-level marketing companies, or... Wow, I had to turn the volume down on that, but didn't do it in time, so R.I.P. eardrums. Mm. Okay, let's see what he has to say, because there was clearly just people showing how they lost money, not the people who have made money, and we don't know under what context they lost the money as well, so a lot of information still left to be learned. Here we go, though. MLMs seem to be everywhere lately. Plenty of us know someone who tries to sell beauty or health products on social media. While those posts can be annoying, you probably see them as benign. However, the institutions behind the products being sold in those posts are often much more nefarious than people assume. Half-jokingly, some people call MLMs cults. A growing subculture of people against MLMs often make that claim more seriously. If you don't know much about MLMs, that may seem ridiculous, but if we dig deep into common MLM practices, we can see what they're getting at. Now, the layman's definition of cult is so broad and subjective that it's nearly useless. That definition being a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious or great devotion to a person, idea, object, movement, or work. Basically, this definition allows anyone to define groups of people united under similar ideas as a cult as long as they don't like that group. That's not very useful. However, there- But that is the definition, so you just don't agree with it. That's really what it comes down to. If you have an anti-MLM, predisposition and you don't like a definition because it applies to many of the other things that you do or like, you know, like a, a tech group or an anti-MLM group or an atheist group or, or a YouTube, you know, association or YouTube channels or, or this or that affiliation, an obsession or, you know, a following of something, you know, you just can't cop out and say, hey, cult doesn't apply to me because I don't like the definition. Like, all right, if you don't like the definition, that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to you. That's all I'm saying. There is a more useful way to talk about what it is to be cult-like, and that is to make use of the work of cult experts within the field of psychology, such as Stephen Hassan and his Bite model. That model is a description of the control tactics which cults often use, and a useful tool in determining whether or not a group is the type of manipulative, harmful influence that we often think cults to be. And you'd also have to apply those to the things that you're passionate about, whether that's the atheism community, or the you know anti-MLM community or other things as well. So it goes both ways, right? You, you can't just say, I don't like the definition, let's use some expert to apply it to the things I don't like, right? You also have to look into the things that you also do and you're about as well. So again, we, we just have to try to be more objective is, is my point. We'll see how MLMs fit that model in a second, but I'll quickly introduce MLMs for those who don't know how they work. An MLM starts with a few people developing and selling a line of products, but instead of hiring salaried salesmen, they recruit pretty much anyone to sell their products for commission, and more importantly, to recruit others to work under them. The incentive to recruit people under you is that you get a percentage of every sale made by those below you. And the key to remember is that the recruit and sell business model with regards to network marketing is more of a traditional form of network marketing and that is where the business opportunity is what is being led with versus authentic network marketing is focused on products powerful products as well as teaching and sharing there is a significant difference between those and that difference needs to be noted and because because so many people are you know whether it's MLM people have you know don't have the sales training properly or you know they haven't read an Eric Worre GoPro book or you know their mentors haven't taught them well enough that hey there are people who you know respond to a traditional network marketing company you know business model of you know recruit and sell but it's a small percentage 
okay? That percentage will vary based on the person, product, or company. What we should be focused on is adding value through powerful products, if you believe in the products as being powerful, and focus on teaching and sharing and matching a need with a goal with a solution. That's what it should be because that will make up the vast majority of a network marketing company's business, which is customers or wholesale customers. And so that's the key distinguishing factor there. And to be able to have that discernment and an education level is absolutely critical. That's why I can go to a different network marketing company's business meeting or presentation and totally assess where they're at, what my needs and goals are, and walk away without buying anything if I don't have a need. You know, sometimes I just go just for curiosity's sake or to see what businesses are out there and or to support a friend, but I don't just buy something because I'm people pressured or I don't just buy something because you know, I'm already part of an MLM. Like I have to have a realized need. I have to have a goal that's, I have to have, a, you know, I have a problem that's in need of a solution that's currently not being met. Like there's a lot of stuff. And then on top of that, I have to know, like, and trust the person, product, and company enough for me to say, you know what, my action threshold has been lowered. I'm ready to make a purchasing decision. And that takes time because any network marketing business operates under building relationships when it's done properly. So those are all important things to remember and you're probably like well who has time for all of that but guess what I do <laughs> because I value understanding I value seeking the truth and I value not just buying something because I'm pressured to or I'm not I need to have more information to make an educated decision and an educated consumer is a very powerful consumer because it's more than just people pressure or hard selling or or you know being sold a business opportunity through hype or exaggerated claims. It's actually looking at things and doing your research. And that puts you in a very leveraged position as a consumer, whether it be with an MLM company, a corporation, mom and pop shop, franchise, whatever it is that you're, you know, potentially a customer or, you know, business builder of. Those high up in the company who showed up very early on get a high percentage, while those below them get a lower and lower percentage with every level they are further from the top. This means that the best way to make that's not true. It depends which company you're referring to. This is just, he's making generalizations. So somebody under you with a network marketing company can surpass you in rank and income if they perform better and have better results. So that is the key to remember. How often is that? Well, that's what you have to look at an income disclosure statement, but then also within the context of an organization and ask questions and maybe interview people. And like how many people in your organization are out ranking you or out earning you? And yes, it may be zero, it may be one, it may be three. I know a lot of, of, you know, my mentors and uplines have people that have surpassed them, you know, and it, it happens sometimes. A lot of times it doesn't. But, you know, again, generalizations are just that. They're generalizations. They're not a case-by-case -case basis with, you know, his claims. Make money in an MLM is to recruit as many salespeople under you as possible. Essentially, you want to build this shape. Hmm, how curious. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of consultants or distributors, people who sign up to sell MLM products, not only fail to make a sustainable profit, but fail to make any money at all. Most consultants actually lose money. According to a study made by Dr. John M. Taylor, which was made publicly available by the FTC, 99.6% of MLM recruits lose money. That's actually worse than classic no product pyramid schemes and even less lucrative than literally playing roulette in Vegas. Now that we've gotten that out of the way. What we need to get in the way is why that is though. Okay, so you can't just show a statistic because it supports your agenda. What we also need to factor in is the success as a distributor or business builder within a network marketing company is due to five main factors. Number one is your skills. Number two, it's your goals. Number three, it's your effort. Number four, it's the quantity and quality of your network. And then number five is your lead generation system. And other people will, will gloss over that or not even care about that. And anti-MLM people won't even mention any of those. Or they may mention one, maybe, or they'll say, why are you blaming me for my lack of results or failure or losing money in a company? And it's not. I'm outlining what I've researched have found to be the top five things that determine someone's success. Success. Now you can reach ceilings in those areas because you know you only have so much time to develop your skills or you may have capability issues or time issues or money issues that you know limit your ability to focus on your skills or your goals or your effort that you can put in. Maybe you're you know you already have a full-time job or maybe you you know ha are tight on money or maybe your spouse is, is or isn't supportive or maybe your network is small or maybe your network is large but it's not a quality one or maybe you don't have a lead generation system or a way to 
you know, constantly have an influx of new people that you're talking to and could potentially help. There's so many factors in all of that that aren't being factored into this that I think are important for the discussion and just throwing out a low percentage, you know, without actually understanding why that is and what makes the others, you know, the, all those other categories have prerequisites too. If you're going to have a small business, you have to have, you know, licenses or permits or, or you, you know, typically have to have a loan if you're going to have a brick and mortar, which costs money. You know, most businesses fail within five years, and so that's not being factored in. Like, you, you can't just throw out a statistic and say most people lose money. You have to, like, look at how, what are the prerequisites of every business, you know, the startup costs, the maintenance costs, as well as how many are successful or still in business after three, five, ten years to really get a good idea. And prerequisites, again, could be college degree for a corporate position or a master's degree or, you know, even a PhD for a professor position. You know, there's so many prerequisites for stuff that you have to, you know, have in order to pre-qualify for certain things. And so that's also important to know. There, I think, you know, there's a lot more to the story than just, A, hey, they lose money. And, you know, you look at people at Costco who have a wholesale membership. Every time they buy coconut oil, every time they buy, you know, dried mango strips or they buy cereal or they buy fruits and vegetables for their green smoothie or whatever it is they buy from Costco, they get a discount. And they're not losing money. They're spending money. They're spending money in exchange for value, something that they value that will help them in their life. And so somebody could say, "Well, they're losing money, Lance. You have to treat it like a business if you're a distributor." But you also have to look at: Are you all? Are you first becoming a customer? Like maybe somebody's goal is just to subsidize their order. You know, maybe somebody's goal is to earn their products for free each month. Maybe another person's goal is to earn more than that and earn part-time income. Maybe somebody's goal is to earn full-time income. We have to factor in what other people's goals are too. And the fact that there's an element of subsidy that could happen with their orders each month. And not just quote unquote losing money. It could be spending money to offset another cost. Uh, you know, they're replacing something that they're already buying at a store or, you know, health, lo health food store or something like that. So again, my, my, my goal is just to kind of give more perspective and all that because I think, you know, it's provide the other side because he, obviously he's anti-MLM and, you know, he shows that in his videos. But I'm for MLM, but at the same time, I try to look at both sides more objectively, I would say. And his is just very, very um, one-sided. It is fact-based, I would say, but it's one-sided fact-based. And that's, that's what's most concerning because whenever you're one-sided, that's like saying a coin only has heads on it, which would not be fully complete or accurate. You'd have to say a coin has a tail and a head side, as well as ridges around it and a year and different, you know, you know, you know, notations on it, depending on what year it was made. And some there's collector's edition coins and there's, you know, all types of coins that also, you know, are pennies or nickels or court. There's so many like ways you can define something. I think just to say it's heads, there's only one side and heads is the best or you know, there's only one side, it's tails, and it's the worst. <laughs> you know, like, there, there's more to the story. You know, there's more to this video as well. <laughs> um, and you can check out that in the description below, because if not, this video could probably go on for a really long time with me <laughs> basically going on about what he's going to say. But I kind of have an idea. But you can get the, the rest of it on his channel. And again, that link will be in the description below. Well, cults can be defined in many different ways. And it's important to think about our own choices in life and how that could be defined as a cult as well. I mean, that's not a popular topic right there. You're like, Lance, I'm not involved in a cult because I'm not an, in an MLM. I'm not involved in essential oil business or customer or anything like that. But it's just like, all right, well, if you have, like, for genetically modified skeptics case, he's atheist and he's anti-MLM. So... Could those be considered cults as well? Well, we'd have to run it by the definition of Merriam-Webster, which is basically saying you're obsessed with a, a people group or a, a person or a company or an organization. And, you know, that would that could be argued. You know, I, I'd argue he is, right? He's a part of a couple cults. Um, now, according to the expert he mentioned, could that be defined? Well, we'd have to look at all the little points and see where they stack up and don't. Um, but that is a more objective way to look at our own life, right? You want to take the log out of our own eye and before we try to take out the speck in somebody else's, which is a biblical reference, which he wouldn't appreciate. But at the same time, it's important to do that, right? We need to see in our own lives, what are we doing that can display cult-like behavior? Okay, let's just, you know, that could be family. I know you're like, hold, hold on, man. Don't go after the family, man. This is a family show, family video, YouTube family friendly, but don't go after my family. 
hold on. <laughs> what I'm saying is, if we're going to make a claim, we need to see where it also applies. That's all I'm saying. And if we don't like that, then just say, I don't like that definition. And although it could apply, I don't see it as applying for me because of these reasons. And he kind of does that. He kind of says that the definition is useless with regards to the cult definition. But, eh, I mean, that's a meh type of response. I think more details would be needed to see exactly where what his beliefs are and how it does fit and how it doesn't fit. And, and that would be more objective. And I think you could come to a, a more accurate conclusion. And you could see that cults could be a part of a lot of our lives if we're using a broad definition or even a certain degree with regards to that expert's definition that he, you know, his little point system. And so there are little quadrants, whatever you want to call it, right? You get what I'm saying. Well, that concludes today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button if you did. Hit subscribe for future video updates. And most importantly, check out the links in the description below so you can continue to get your learn on. And I'll see you in the next video.